what does the pine cone represent? Why is that shown around the world? But more importantly, what does the handbag symbol represent that we see all around the world? This knowledge was kept only in the most high levels with priests and magi. Only those at the top could understand what these meant. Many of these ancient symbols throughout history were eventually inverted and perverted to their opposite meanings. In some cases, to almost demonize them, to, to seem like it's something that's evil when it's truly something that's the complete opposite. These individuals, they are the keepers of knowledge and the keepers of how to create civilizations. They're the ones that jump-started every major advanced, sophisticated civilization we can around the world. I really think this is gonna help connect a lot of these missing pieces for people that are uh, yearning for this knowledge. So I want to give just a tiny little bit of a background because I know that not everybody that comes to this information is at the same level. You know, they haven't necessarily studied this for years and years and years. Maybe they're just discovering this for the first time. So what I want to do is just give a really small, uh, very short, uh, higher level and lower level perspective of this before we really get into what we're talking about. Because I feel like this information specifically is, is at the highest level. It's not something you just jump right into and start talking about, or you're going to get a lot of people that haven't studied it, roll their eyes and turn this video off and say, I don't know what he's talking about. So I want to set the stage for what this information is and why it's so important. Over the last couple of years, the last several years of studying this and writing books and trying to understand the earliest point of when civilization started here, there was always these questions that came up, questions revolving around what are those cylinder seals that, that have been found in ancient Mesopotamia? What do they represent? What do these murals represent with all these depictions from the past? What are these ancient symbols we find in places like in the Americas, all the way into Turkey, down into Egypt, down into Mesopotamia? Why do we find the same symbols shared by so many different cultures around the world when in our history books we're taught that, that cult those cultures had no contact with one another, especially across oceans? They were disconnected from different time periods in history, and it's all just random, right? Human civilizations emerged just based on randomness. Some group of kings and group of hunter-gatherers got together, they decided to settle on a location, and then they built an empire, and then that event empire eventually collapsed. And that's the whole story we're given. We're told this entire narrative of our, of our civilization can be put into this 6,000-year window with just enormous amounts of slaves being forced into manual labor to create these enormous structures like the pyramids. This is the version we're told. Moving these enormous blocks on these wooden pillars and all these things, it just doesn't make any sense anymore. This old narrative and paradigm that we're taught about how human civilizations got created, how old they are, what the knowledge and the information that was handed down to them, where did it come from? All of these things are starting to become much more in the forefront of conversations. And we're not there yet. A lot of society is still sleeping and believes this, this narrative that we're told that I just described, this very simplistic narrative that really does govern our lives. If we think that we're just primitive apes that have no connection to the stars and we have no understanding of what we really are, this, this higher vibrational being that is a co-conscious creator of this reality around us, if they don't have that perspective, think about how that governs their lives. So that's why I think this information is so important. What we're gonna do today is we're gonna answer some very, very important questions that are just sort of sifting around and floating around the internet that I get I get emails and I get questions all the time from people. They, they'll ask me, what do the Anunnaki look like? Are they reptilian? Are they serpent headed? What what do these the term uh what does the pine cone represent why is that shown around the world but more importantly what does the handbag symbol represent that we see all around the world what do they really represent we got to start with symbolism because that's the biggest piece of this to understand now for those who have followed my work for the last few years who have read uh, my latest book, The Stage of Time, they know that I discuss the eagle, the symbols of the eagle and the serpent extensively. 
discuss how it's not really supposed to be a literal translation. You know, in Mesopotamia, when we find this depiction of a serpent-headed individual, it's very easy to want to jump on that and say that's a, that's a, some a reptilian being. Very easy to jump on that. And I don't want to throw anybody under the bus and say that you're wrong, but I want to explain my side and my take on how that explains what that means. When you have something serpent-headed, just like when it's described like in the Code of Hammurabi, black-headed, we're talking about symbolism that's shown what someone's mentality is. That's why when we have depictions of some of the Anunnaki, they have an eagle head. They didn't really have eagle heads, and they didn't really have serpent heads. It was a, it was a symbolic way to describe their mentality. If someone, their mentality is focused on governing through war and control, and uh, the masculine the the masculine energy of creation your that symbol was always shown through the symbol of the eagle that's what that symbol meant and the serpent would always represented knowledge and wisdom so in that case it really wasn't a scary image with that serpent headed it actually represented very knowledgeable a being that was very very smart very knowledgeable not like the the society around them the farmers the ones who were fishing the common man back then those types of people didn't understand any of this this knowledge was kept only in the most high levels with priests and magi the only those at the top could understand what these meant yes the eagle and the serpent are some of the most important symbols that we have but these two that we're about to talk about may be the most important two because they really represent the totality of all of this so what you have in front of you is a lot of different images all thrown together, a collage of images together here. And I wanted to just break some of these down and show you guys this as we're going along. Now, the images at the top part of the screen and the left part, these are depictions of the Anunnaki, okay? And that's that's essentially, those three are the Anunnaki themselves. And we'll get into a little bit more about why they look different. But I mentioned the mentality symbolism with the head thing. That image with the eagle head is Ninurta. It's an ancient god of war. That's why it has an eagle head. Nerta was known as the basically the 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 major um, influencer of the Roman Empire, and you can find that with the Nerta symbol right there. You'll see it with the Byzantine double-headed eagle, and I showed that on the last image on the on the rock shown in the background. That that represented having awareness and knowing everything about all around you so having something look left and right meanings would be knowing all but not knowing in a knowledge sense being aware of everything knowing what everyone's doing being one step ahead of them this was the nurta symbol now what you'll see though in even in that case being an eagle-headed mentality that i described there they have this symbol of a pine cone in their hand nearly every time they're holding that pine cone and pointing in a certain direction. And as we go along, looking at these specific, specific murals from Mesopotamia that, that, that I'm gonna be talking about, talking about which reference either Kings or the Anunnaki, I want people to remember when what you're looking at, everything has meaning. Every little curl, every little mark, every single thing they put in these designs means something. That's what's so fascinating about it. I've literally stared at some of these for hours and hours on end, just try to figure out what they're representing. So what I'm showing here, essentially, just to break it down is these Anunnaki individuals, these figures are holding a pine cone. They're, they're always facing it forward in front of them. Now, when you go to the Vatican in Rome, where the Pope, the Pope stands out and, and get, comes out and gives all those commandments and talks to everybody, what you find in the square is a giant pine cone symbol, the largest in the entire world, sitting in the center of their um, religious establishment there, this enormous pine cone, okay? At the same time, the Pope on his staff has a pine cone built, is built right into the wood itself. You can see that depicted down the bottom as well as a hat that he's, he wears called the miter hat. Now, when, when you look into the story of the Dogon, this, the ancient tribe that's in Western, Southwestern or Western Africa in the country of Mali, you find out that this, this Dogon tribe had all of this knowledge about the stars and the heavens way before the first telescopes were ever invented, before they ever had influences from other cultures. You just had this remote tribe in the middle of the Western Africa that had knowledge about the, the heavens that literally no one had knowledge of at that time. 
or very few select groups. And so when French anthropologists first came over to meet them in the 1930s, they couldn't understand how this tribe knew the detailed alignments and celestial movements of Sirius A, B, and even C. And Sirius B hadn't even been discovered yet. It wasn't discovered for years and years later until the first radio telescopes were made. And this culture somehow knew vast amounts of knowledge about our cosmos and in about our planet as well. And the reason I say that, I bring up that story, is that if you look at depictions of the Dogon that they have, they show this, this in aquatic serpent-like fish being known as Awanus. And Awanus has a hat on in those depictions. And that hat is where the miter hat came from. And Awanus is passing on that knowledge in these depictions to these Dogon people. So when you look at the Pope today, it's simply just a reference from these ancient knowledge bringers that passed along knowledge. And Awanus is, it wasn't really an aquatic fish being. It was just a symbol to represent Anki. And when you, because when you look at cyl cylinder seals of Anki, you see that he essentially has these fish coming down through the, the th above him. And he's basically in charge of the God of fresh water and balance. And so all these things that we see today, in these corrupted religious establishments and these inverted truths of these symbols, they all go back to a much more ancient time before they really became inverted to their opposite meanings, just like something like the swastika. All those things were either inverted or or hidden so that we no longer understood what they are. The pine cone is, is absolutely, it's all around the world. We find it in Hindu cultures, we find it in Egyptian cultures, we find it all around the world um, as we get into, we're gonna get into in a second. We know that the pine cone represented knowledge, the passing of knowledge and wisdom. We know that the pine cone represented both our third eye, the pineal gland within the human, the human brain, as well as it represented this honeycomb hexagonal design, the seeds of life, the seeds of knowledge that represented basically this intelligent design behind all of nature itself. So they decided to use of any symbol in the entire world, the pine cone represented the passing of knowledge and wisdom. And that's why it's shown being pushed in front of themselves and being handed to other cultures. What's important about us establishing that is that, that we can then take that understanding and apply it to other symbols because they're related. And that's how this works is we can, we can take related symbols and allow us to help us expand to understand what they all mean. The pine cone and the handbag is literally shared by every single area in the world we can establish that there were what we find evidence for lost civilizations. And that's why this is so important because these symbols that we find in all these different parts of the world where we also have megalithic structures and sophisticated things that were built that would have been impossible for a primitive culture with Bronze Age tools, we find these same symbols. And that's what's so important about defining them because it allows us to say, ah, that's who influenced them for, so that to create those civilizations. And that's why they're so similar to others. What we have on the screen is probably the most debated of all the symbols that exist today is the symbol of the handbag. Now, I will fully admit when I first started studying this, I thought it was some kind of a bag that maybe held psychedelics to like um, psilocybin or something to help expand some culture's mind or something when they're in a church. I, I couldn't understand, well, what is in that bag? You know, what are they providing? And there's been so many individuals have said, well, it represents technology, some kind of technology they they had that helped them to build the, the civilization. And this is where I've come to, and this is where I want to try to lay down the definition I think makes the most sense to connect with the pineal gland. And it's going to make more sense as we go along because we have depictions with all of them together in the next in the next coming slides. So we'll put all this together in one place. So the handbag symbol has been shown um, in almost every single place that we have megalithic lost civilization imagery and, and structures around the world. We find these symbols, this handbag. Now on the left side is pillar 43 at Gobekli Tepe. So we see the same handbag symbol there, and that's in Turkey. Now, the, the image in the middle is one of these Anunnaki images with him with the pine cone holding it out and then the handbag down below. The following one on the right is from Mexico, La Venta, Mexico with the Olmec. And you can see um, 
Quetzalcoatl, Kukukon Quetzalcoatl up behind him with essentially uh, an, indiv an Olmec individual with a with a, a head of a, of a serpent as well, like serpent headed, remember? Holding and, and passing along a handbag. So what does this mean? What is it? What does it really represent? Well, the pre think about what the previous symbol represented the passing of knowledge. Okay. The passing of knowledge to another individual, not just generic knowledge, higher knowledge, knowledge of everything. If you were to try to sit down and explain to someone everything to have them understand uh, from a higher level, understand the balance of nature, understand consciousness, energy, understand the cosmos, understand how to create a civilization. All these things come into, that's what's needed for an individual to be able to do what they've done throughout history in these empires. So what did the handbag represent then? The handbag was the tools needed to create a civilization. So if you sit down with someone and you are passing the pine cone of knowledge, you're just telling them something, you're telling them knowledge, you're having them understand like what I just described, the nature of reality, understanding ener energy, all those things. That's one thing, right? To have knowledge, to have it and understanding is one thing. But how do you create a civilization? How do you design a civilization? What are the blueprints for that civilization? What are the morals that would be laid down for that civilization? How is that civilization going to be governed? What are the rules going to be? That's what that symbol represents. It's the tools needed to create that entire civilization. So that's why you have a pine cone from the knowledge side. And then here is coming right next to it. Holy, but notice he's not, he's not passing along. He's in some cases, he's passing along the pine cone and passing along the bag. But in other cases, he's holding it by his, his side as well. These individuals, they are the keepers of knowledge and the keepers of how to create civilizations. They're the ones that jump started every major advanced, sophisticated civilization we can around the world. When we see lost civilizations, this is where these influences came from. They came from those who are passing along knowledge through the pine cone and the tools to create civilizations around the world. And that's why we find these two depictions so closely used in nearly every depiction, because what's the end game here? If you had an advanced group that wanted to design the infrastructure for, enough, for a planet, design the infrastructure with cities for what people would do, for how to run the, the world, how to clear channels for river channels for agriculture, for how to map the heavens, you would need all of these different tools and, and knowledge to be able to do that. And that's what I really feel like these symbols represented when they're handing them down. But it goes even deeper too. And this is where it's it's a it's a rabbit hole. It, it truly is. We find ample evidence all around the world, just like we found evidence for these symbols being shown, that there have been devastating catastrophes that have occurred on, occurred on the earth. And maybe not even just during one time period, but maybe as a part of a cyclical basis, where maybe every like every 12,000 years, it seems like some disaster occurs, which is why they were so obsessed with mapping the heavens, because they could understand not only the the energy of the cosmos but they could also map and understand when events are going to happen when what time period is occurring at at at, at in on a on a collect uh on a, a larger level looking at it more on a, a the basis on the solar system level not on a just a looking at our understanding of time so these these civilizations were wiped out collectively around the world based on series of cataclysms we find. And we know that based on erosion we find around like the Sphinx enclosures. When we look at Greenland ice core samples, we, we see a very, very devastating event that occurred between about 12,800 and about 10,800 years ago over a multi, potentially over a thousand year period of multiple events that seem to have wiped out all of these civilizations are just left either just their megalithic structures that they built with no writing at all or in some cases these cuneiform tablets which was the ingenious way that they could they knew that they could preserve a message etched into stone or clay so that it would survive that's why there's so few writings from any of these cultures anywhere in the world because if they had used paper or anything digital none of it would have survived and so when, when some ask about, well, how do you know Atlantis was, was real? We don't have any of the writings from Atlantis, really. We have very little. We have 
anything that was either channeled or came through ancient Egypt because Egypt was the only connection that we can find back to Atlantis when Solon went there and then told Plato about the story of Atlantis. So all we have, E. Willie, is basically these scraps and these little breadcrumbs left behind from what is disasters that we can't even wrap our heads around in terms of human history for events that have occurred for what that for what happened to them to be able to try to understand what this story is and that's why it's so difficult because we're talking about a culture e willie and jp that disappeared in many cases well over ten thousand years ago so guys this is what we're going to go some high level stuff now for those who love high level in in Gobekli Tepe, which is in the Anatolia region of Turkey, you see Pillar 43, which is the most important of all the pillars there. Now, these pillars are massive, massive megalithic pillars that are built out of a single stone. They're these huge T-shaped pillars, and they weigh more than 20 tons each. And they have all these strange depictions on them. The first thing to mention about Pillar 43 is it has the handbag symbol at the very top meaning the tools needed to create a civilization, right? So they're worshiping that knowledge and those tools that created their civilization. Why is that so interesting and important? I've mentioned this before, but I want to mention it again for those who don't know. Gobekli Tepe is one of the most important sites, not for its sophisticated sophistication with megalithic giant blocks like we see in uh, across Peru or in Egypt, not for that reason, but because it contains certain levels of archeological evidence that helps us to really understand this story well, to back up this information. And what you find in Gobekli Tepe is that as, they, as they've uncovered different layers going down in, they found that this entire astronomical temple, which is what this was, was buried under mountains of debris, deliberately buried and hidden, closed off. When they finally got down and dug in, they found this temple, they found that there were very peculiar layers of organic material within other layers that went down deep below that. And they were able to radiocarbon date that organic material to 11,800 years ago for this civilization in Gobekli Tepe that made that temple. So we know that. We know that that base value. And we also know that that was the time period that was a lot of violent earth changes were happening based on ice core samples. The same destructive time period during the Younger Dryas period around 12,000 years ago. When they did, when they went down and uncovered those layers, remember, we're told that every civilization is simply nomadic hunter gatherers. And they just, in terms of Gobekli Tepe, that what mainstream archaeologists tell us is that this group just happened to decide to stop hunting and, and hang out there for a few years and build the most sophisticated astronomical temple ever built. That makes a lot of sense, right? But what makes more sense is when you go down through the layers, you find that in the layers right below where this construction was done, we do find hunter-gatherer evidence, extensive hunter-gatherer evidence. There were hunter-gatherers moving through this region, but then right above it, within a very, very short amount of material, only with, within years, say, of material that could have been accumulated, we see all the sophistication that comes out of nowhere. Agriculture starts getting practiced. S uh, cities are built. We find sophisticated um, society has emerged on this site out of nowhere, seemingly out of nowhere. And then what do we find on that pillar? Those handbags shown like if you were, let's say you were a hunter-gatherer group, you were living in that region hunting wild animals and just in living off the land. And all of a sudden, this group of enlightened individuals comes in and teaches you all of this wisdom and knowledge. They completely change the structure of your society. They, they, they give you all these tools. They give you understandings. Of, they teach you how to farm. They teach you about the cosmos. They teach you about consciousness. They, they give you all this information and knowledge. They give you the tools to create those civilizations, and then they leave. What are you going to do? You're going to worship them. You're going to worship them, either either them, where they came from, or even just celestial understandings of energy, and we'll get into that in a second. But now look what's below the handbag symbols. We see a vulture, okay? And we see a vulture who's got a circular round thing above his arm. And some have speculated that that's a, that's a comet or an asteroid. Now look below the vulture, you see a scorpion. Now let me break this down 
what I want to explain here and describe is notice on the left, you have the handbag symbol in the top, and then you have the vulture and the scorpion. Now, if we look at up in the cosmos, we find that we, we see strikingly similar similarities with what's known as Cygnus. It's the, the constellation of Cygnus and Scorpius represent those depictions. And now they're in a very, look at the alignment of them. Not only are they shown on this cosmological chart, they're in the exact same position to each other. Look at Cygnus and look at Scorpius below it. Now at the top, Cygnus is connected to a star. Look at, see the hand of, or, or the wing of the vulture? There's a star right above its wing. That star happens to be called Deneb. And it's the, one of the brightest stars, not in our region, but the entire galaxy. One of the most illuminating stars in all of the galaxy happens to be right above Cygnus. But not just a coincidence. Think about the symbol of the cross, getting into symbols. The ancient cross, the most ancient symbol of all, which, by the way, predates Christian religions by thousands of years. In fact, these Anunnaki um, symbols that we're going to show in these murals, they have the symbol of the cross on in, in many different places. It's one of the most ancient symbols of all. And to, to put this to bed, too, the cross represents the crossing of energy, mind, body, and soul, the three ingredients for humans to reach ascension. That's what has been taught all throughout history. It's still the teachings of Jesus in the in the Roman the Roman Christian Bible it's there is good there's good information there but it, it originally came from a much earlier place it represented the crossing of energy and it just so happens that Cygnus it represents a constellation of a cross and the, the one of the brightest stars in our entire galaxy happens to be the top of the cross which would represent essentially ascension I find that incredibly interesting so we find Cygnus and Scorpius in this in this depiction at Gobekli Tepe with handbags right above it. Now, I'd like people to think about that for a little bit. What does that mean? Does that mean that they those those in, those beings who who provided does it mean that they that they're the ones who brought those tools? Those are there's those endless questions that go into that, but I want to leave people with that understanding of what's shown on that and how those handbag symbols are right above that. Now there's one more incredibly interesting piece of the puzzle. Just so happens that Cygnus and Scorpius are in what's known as the dark rift of our galaxy. The dark rift is an area of the galaxy that has the highest amount of dark energy of our entire galaxy is in that location. For those who don't know what dark energy is, it's when you think of a system of balance as above as below, you find when you look at something like the underworld and heaven, higher and lower dimensions, there's always balance no matter what. Dark matter would be like the equivalent of the underworld for our planet, but in the galaxy. It is the other side of matter. Everything is always balanced. Now, guys, this is probably, I would have to argue, my favorite depiction of any mural in the world. It may seem silly, but something like this can answer almost everything. Think about all the stuff we've talked about. What does the pine cone mean? What does the handbag mean? They're, they're right here but we get a lot more information than just that. Now, guys, I'm gonna break this whole thing down and this is where I think is gonna help connect a lot of pieces for people, a lot of these clues that remain hidden. Now, like a puzzle piece to try to put together this lost story of history, we t you take it one piece at a time. So once you know the pine cone means the passing of knowledge and wisdom, you put that piece in the place. Then you understand how they're holding this, this the handbag. You put that piece into place. If you have the understanding that beings that have wings, it's supposed to represent gods, ascended beings that are from other dimensions. You put that piece into place too. And what do you get? You get a depiction here that tells an entire story. It tells an entire story of what occurred in the past to create sophisticated civilizations. Now, let me break it down. Notice there's two individuals in the center that are surrounded by what's called the tree of life. And then there's two individuals on the outside. And then in the, above the tree of life, you have um, the winged solar disc with Anu in the center, okay? Now Anu is like running the wheels of this, of this tree, this life, like balance. And the more you learn about the Anunnaki, the more you find that they're obsessed with maintaining balance. 
they did a lot of bad stuff here. But because of that, they had to do certain roles and responsibilities to regain that balance. And that's one of the obsessions they always have, no matter what you look at. That's why the tree of life is always depicted. This balance of life here, this balance of nature, the creation of life, it's all balanced by, according to them, the Anunnaki are in charge of that. That's their responsibility, okay? Now, I used to think that this was supposed to depict all of the Anunnaki. All These were four Anunnaki. That's not right. That's incorrect, and I, it took me a long time to understand that. The way you know that is not just by the wings. Look at their what they're wearing on their heads. Notice that very carefully. Besides wings, the Anunnaki, if they're shown with their physical head, not a serpent or an eagle, they're always shown the same way. They have horns, ringed horns around their helmet, and they always have three. That's a status symbol for the Anunnaki. That means that the two individuals on the outer side, and it doesn't really mean on either side. Remember, it represents both sides, right? Balance. The four. The two on either end and the two kings in the center. Now notice, the kings are the same height as the Anunnaki. And like I said, I think some things are supposed to be literal, right? Some things are symbolic, but other things are literal. They're the same height as the Anunnaki. Now look, the Anunnaki aren't reptilian. We're, remember, we're created in their image, not the other way around. We are them. So therefore, look at all the Mesopotamian kings that are depicted all throughout history. When we look at Ashur, when we look at um, King Hammurabi, when we look at Sennacherib, when we look at um, Ashurbanipal, notice they look just like the Anunnaki, like they're imitating them, right? They have the long locks of hair all braided. But what do they not have? Notice what's on their head. They don't have any horns. They have a completely different type of symbol on their head. And they don't have handbags or pine cones. You see that? It's telling you a story. Let me So let me break this whole thing down. The Anunnaki had bloodline king offspring based on the Nef which are called the Nephilim. Okay. We know that when we look into the, the, the we look into Genesis, we look into all book of Enoch, all kinds of ancient stories from the past. It extensively talks about that, that giants were once here, that ancient Kings really weren't, weren't what we thought they were. They were actually like bloodline Anunnaki Kings from directly from their bloodline. And so what they, their obsession here was to have their seed rule over the society. So these Kings are direct bloodline Kings of the Anunnaki. They're being given the knowledge and wisdom to create civilization. Okay. And that's why they're depicted in the center around the tree of life. Now notice what they're carrying in their, in their left arm. They have what's known as the masculine rod of kingship of ruling. And it was always males that did that did the majority of these ancient civilizations were males. There were some civilizations in parts of Africa that were run by females. And there were some, some areas of Africa had female Kings and priests and, and all. And, and that was an example in, in areas, but in majority of the time, it were these bloodline males, these masculine rulers that would take over and, and rule society. And that's really what's to being depicted here in the center. So they have the masculine rod and then look what they're doing. Just like you see, they're pointing the way it is their way and or nothing. They are handing down the rules and responsibilities that the Anunnaki gave to them, almost like an emissary that works for someone that's very powerful. They're the ones who are supposed to then use all of that knowledge, the tools to create a civilization, the knowledge, the laws handed down them to them, specific laws. It was all under one umbrella called kingship. Everywhere is the same phrase. Kingship was lowered. Kingship was lowered here. Kingship was lost, then re-lowered. And we're going to get into that in a second. But essentially, you have the Anunnaki having these bloodline kings that they feel are superior, that should rule over the rest of society. They're telling them the way to create those civilizations and how to govern them. And in the center, you have the Zoroastrian symbol with Anu, who's basically pulling the wheels. He's He's on the, almost like the bike of life. He's the one who's in charge of all of the Anunnaki and balance. So when you put the whole thing together, 
it's like the Anunnaki are creating a specific type of kingship civilization for our societies here in their image, in their likeness, in their mentality. Okay. And that's what I, what I think is so interesting though, if we go back a little bit, just notice how often they're depicted with an eagle head though, not a regular head and not a serpent head. It's actually quite rare. You do see it like with the, when I showed you in Laventa, uh, the Olmec, how they show Kukukon coming up with the serpent. Yeah, it's, it's there, but it's much more rare. What does that mean? It means that the majority of the time, the Anunnaki, when they were creating these civilizations, created them to be warlike empires, which is why throughout history, it's always been governed by war because it's the easiest way to control civilizations and keep them in a lower state of consciousness. There's always been this battle of the Anunnaki where they didn't want us to become greater than them. And that's what a lot of these struggles have been.